go ahead and get started then. We'll start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment to recall in the presence of Almighty God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, not yet. All right. all right. So, first of all, some introductory comments uh, before tonight. Like I said, if you want to submit questions, there's a little basket back there now. You can submit questions. Um, if you want to learn more about the faith and some of the fundamentals of the faith, right? I just wanted to make some book recommendations. Those of you who are in RCIA, this is the book that we give to everybody in RCIA. This is a summary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's 338 pages, so the catechism is well over 2,000 pages. Okay, so it's a nice little summary. However, I do definitely recommend the catechism of the church. Um, this came out in 1994, and you know a lot of people think of the catechism as basically just an encyclopedia, and you can use it as that. There's a really nice index in the back of the catechism where you can look up you know, basically any topic that you would want to learn what the church teaches about it, right? So very helpful indexes, right? But uh, when I was in seminary, I actually, I literally just read through it from the first page to the last page, right? And the catechism is written in such a way that you can do that, and it's still a good read. Um, some of the nice things about the catechism is that on every page there's a bunch of footnotes from Bible verses that are quoted, or saints that are being quoted, or councils of the church that are being quoted, right? So it's a really nice summary of the Catholic faith. Uh, there's also a really cool section in the back of the catechism. So the catechism is split up into four parts. Uh, the first part is on church doctrine. The second part is on the sacraments. The third part is on morality. And then the last part is actually on prayer. Right? Uh, so if you want to skip ahead to the last part on prayer, there's a bunch of really good quotes from the saints about the spiritual life, right? So I do recommend the catechism. Uh, last thing, uh, last book that I would recommend is uh, Dr. Peter Kreeft. Uh, he's a really well-known theologian and philosopher. Uh, he's written over 100 books, um, and this is his kind of summary of the catechism of the Catholic Church. Right? Again, a much shorter version. Uh, it's written in a question format. It basically just asks a bunch of questions, and he gives you the answers, right, according to the catechism. So these are all resources I would recommend if you want to learn more about the overall scope of theology, okay? Uh, any questions about any of that? Okay, all right. So to get started tonight, I want to do a quiz. So... Instead of passing a quiz out, I want you guys to write write the answers on some of that loo that uh, loose leaf paper right there to have on your tables. I'm saving paper tonight by not printing out more. Right. Tonight's subject is Christology. Christology is literally the study of Jesus, right, or the study of Christ, right? So that's going to be the topic for tonight, and we're going to start with a quiz. This quiz is all true or false answers, so you have a 50% chance of getting the question right. Okay? Everybody got your pen and your paper? All right? 50% chance on all these questions? Let's see how you do, okay? Question number one. Jesus has two intellects. 
true or false. Jesus has two intellects, true or false. Okay. Question number two. Jesus is one person. Jesus is one person. True. All right, number three. Jesus has one nature. Jesus has one nature. True or false? Question number four. Question number four. Jesus has two wills. Two wills. Every soul is made up of an intellect and a will. So the question is, Jesus has two wills, true or false? Number five. In Jesus, the divine nature became a human nature. In Jesus, the divine nature became a human nature. Number six, Jesus knew he was God from the moment of his conception in Mary's womb. Jesus knew that he was God from the moment of his conception in Mary's womb. True or false? I've got to change one of these questions for a while in a second. <laughs> I had to rework this quiz a little bit earlier. Okay, number seven. Jesus thought that he was abandoned on the cross. Jesus thought that he was abandoned on the cross. Number eight, on the cross, Jesus knew each of us and loved each of us, even though we had not been born. On the cross, Jesus knew each of us and loved each of us, even though we had not yet been born. Number nine, on the cross, God died. On the cross, God died. You guys, you're getting them all right. Fifty percent chance. Feeling good. <laughs> Number ten. Jesus was surprised when he rose from the dead. Number 10, Jesus was surprised when he rose from the dead. <clears throat> and finally, number 11. We'll make this an extra credit question. Yeah. <laughs> number 11. Is there anything the Father knows that the Son does not? Is there anything the Father knows that the Son does not? Okay, you guys want to trade a grade? <laughs> not, very, not very easy questions, are they? Right. We talk about Jesus all the time in church. Some of these questions are a little bit challenging, though. All right. All right, so let's uh, keep track of your answers or the person next to you. You guys ready to go through the questions? Okay. 
All right, question number one. Jesus has two intellects. Is that true or false? How many say true? How many say false? The answer is true. Jesus has two intellects. Could you elaborate on that a little yeah. bit? We will throughout the course of the evening. Oh, yes. <laughs> yep. But wait, all, there's more. <laughs> yes. All these questions are related to what we're talking about tonight. So um, if it hasn't been elaborated enough on yet by the end of the class, let me come back to you. Okay? Question number two. Jesus is one person. How many say true? How many say false? The answer is true. Jesus is one person. Jesus is one person. All right, number three. Jesus has one nature. Jesus has one nature. The answer is false. False. Jesus has two natures. All right, number four. Jesus has two wills. True or false? The answer is true. Okay. All right. Number five. In Jesus, the divine nature became a human nature. The answer is... <coughs> False. All right, number six. Number six. Jesus knew that he was God from the moment of his conception in Mary's womb. The answer is true. True. Number seven. Jesus thought that he was abandoned on the cross. True or false? False is correct. Right. Although he did say on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Number eight. On the cross, Jesus knew each of us and loved each of us even though we had not yet been born. The answer is true. 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 Number nine. On the cross, God died. True or false? The answer is true. The answer is true. Number ten. Was Jesus surprised or Jesus was surprised when he rose from the dead? The answer is false. Number eleven, is there anything the father or is there anything the father knows that the son does not? The answer is yes. no. 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 Yes. The answer. Why why do you why do you say yes, Kathy? Because I was thinking in the Bible when they were asking the disciples were asking when the end time would be, Jesus said, Only the Father knows. I myself don't even, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It says, nobody knows the day or the hour, only the Father knows, right? Mm -hmm. So, the early church father said that what Jesus meant there was not that he does not actually know, but rather he is not going to make it known. Right? And the reason why he can't say that the Son did not know that is because God knows all things, right? and Jesus truly is God. Right? And we'll talk about that more throughout the course of this class, okay? But yes... It's a good point, Kathy. There's a lot of there's a lot of points in the gospel where it seemed like Jesus was ignorant of something that he should have known. We actually were not. And we're going to talk about why that has to be the case this evening. Okay? I'll take some of this. All right. 
So tonight we're talking all about Jesus. That's what Christology means. Okay? Which seems like it would be something that would be simple. Something we talk about all the time in church and in homilies. Uh, but as we just learned on this quiz, it can get rather complicated rather quickly. Right? And just some introductory remarks, remarks about Christology. Uh, you might be thinking to yourself after that quiz, you know, all those questions seemed really abstract. You know, why does it matter anyway? Right? The truth is, is that even though theology might seem very complicated, oftentimes it has very practical consequences, especially when we're talking about Jesus, the very person who is the Savior of the world. Right? An example of that would be the very first heresy that arose in the church. Does anybody know what the very first heresy was in the church? It's actually mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. The very first heresy that arose in the church was called the Judaizer heresy. Does anybody know what that heresy meant? That was at the very beginning of the church. People were saying that in order to become a Christian, if you were a man, you first had to be circumcised. Right? Just like the Jews. Right? Okay? So obviously, right, those of you in RCA who are males, right, if that was still a requirement, right, it might cause you to, you know, maybe take your decision a little a little more seriously. Right? So that was the very first heresy that arose in the church. And it caused a huge division uh, in the church. And so that's a great example to point to of why these theological questions matter. It's important that we have clarity. It's important that we understand the truth. And it's especially important that we have a church right, to help us decide these things. In modern Christianity, a lot of times people will say things like, why do we need the church? Why do we need a pope? Right? All these different things. Why can't we just you know, read the Bible and everybody will agree on it? When this heresy arose, literally the, the very disciples of Jesus were divided. They had been with Jesus for three years. They had walked with him after he rose from the dead. And yet even they were divided on this question. It was not until God inspired St. Peter, the first pope, through a dream, where he realized the answer to the question that it was no longer a requirement for people to be circumcised. Right? So if even the very disciples of Jesus were unsure about this, surely there's going to be questions that arise through church history where not everybody in the church is going to be able to agree or figure it out. And you need an infallible church right, to help us answer some of these questions. Okay? So the Judaizer heresy was the very first heresy uh, in the church. The other thing about Christology that I think we should all know is that the Incarnation is incomprehensible. Okay, the Incarnation, that's just the, the word we use in the church to describe the fact that Jesus became a man. That God assumed the human nature. That in the man Jesus, there was actually an infinite being right, within him, even though he appeared to just be a mere human being. And it's incomprehensible to us. How is it possible that something infinite became finite? How is it that somebody who was outside of the world right, became a part of the world? It's incomprehensible. That's one of the reasons why every Sunday at Mass, when we recite the Creed, we all bow our heads when we talk about the Incarnation. Right? Maybe you've noticed that at Mass, we bow our heads. That's why we do that. Because we're actually, we're actually describing the Incarnation in that moment, and so we bow our heads in recognition of the incomprehensibleness of it. Right? Incomprehensible does not mean that it's irrational. It's not what it means. Incomprehensible means that our minds were never going to fully understand right, what it means. Whereas irrational 
would literally mean that it's impossible. That's not what we mean when we talk about the Incarnation. We say that it's incomprehensible. And because it is so hard to understand, it's so incomprehensible, oftentimes the, ways, the way that the church describes it is just through a series of questions that arise. Right? And the church answers disputed questions. Oftentimes, it's, it's not as easy to describe what the Incarnation means. It's easier to say what the Incarnation does not mean. That's why heresies are important in church history. Because the church at different times, somebody will be saying something, the church will say, well, that is wrong. It may be hard to describe exactly what is true, but we know that is not true. That's why heresies are important. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, well, let's get into it then. Let's get into some of the heresies about Jesus. All right, what were some of the earliest heresies about Jesus, right? The first heresy in church history was something called Ebionism. It's called Ebionism because the people who believe this, they were called the Ebionites. And it's maybe the most uh, common heresy in the world today. The Ebionism heresy was just the idea that Jesus was not God. Right? He was just a good human being. He had some nice moral teachings. He was a wise thinker. But he was not truly God. Okay. Second heresy. Adoptionism. Adoptionism is similar to Ebionism in that it did not believe that Jesus was truly God. But what the adoptionists believed is that when Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove, it was in that moment that he became divinized. God adopted him as his son and he became divine in that moment. Okay. Number three, docetism. Docetism was the belief that Jesus only appeared to be a man. Appeared in quotation marks in quotation marks because docere means to appear. That's why they were called the docetists, right? Or the docetists. Jesus was not really a man. He only appeared to be human. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the word of the Gnostics or Gnosticism? Right. So you may, like if you remember some History Channel documentaries and things like that, they're often talking about things like the Gospel of Thomas right, or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene right, or the Gospel of Peter. Right. None of those books are in the Bible. And so sometimes you'll watch documentaries and stuff on the History Channel and they'll bring up these ancient lost Gospels. Right? And they'll say things like, well, maybe the church is hiding these Gospels or something like that. Right? 
And it's not true. You can find any of these Gospels at the public library or on the internet. Um, the church has always known about these texts. But what began to happen in the early church was there is these group of people called the Gnostics. The Docetists would have been a group of the Gnostics. And basically what the Gnostics did was they started taking the Bible and the Gospels and they basically started twisting what it said. So that it still appeared to look similar to the Gospels, but there were very key differences. <clears throat> like, for example, in the Gospel of Thomas, it ends with Jesus ascending into heaven, and the last thing that Jesus tells his disciples is that when women are saved in heaven, they will become men. That's not actually in the Bible anywhere. But in the Gospel of Thomas, supposedly that's what Jesus said. There's other Gnostic Gospels that describe the childhood of Jesus. Some of them describe Jesus basically when kids were making fun of him, that he struck them down and killed them, and then brought them back to life to manifest his power. These are Gnostic Gospels, Gnostic texts. Um, there's a whole host of different texts out there that are described as Gnostic texts, but that's basically what you need to know is that it was all these people trying to basically pretend that they were Christians, but they would twist the stories, right? They were in the Bible. This is the Gnostic. It still happens today, yes. Usually not in an, uh, I mean, in an official capacity. I guess you could say that... Um, People who claim to be mystics, right, and have like visions of Jesus or you know things like that, but they obviously are distorting the true gospel. You could say that they're Gnostics as well. Yeah, is that what you meant, Craig? Or well, you it something else? That it, the the whole idea of twisting everything seems to be just standard fare with with about anything anymore. Yeah, the, the only thing that was different about the Gnostics is that they, you know, they had like official writings and texts, mm -hmm. right? And that's why they call them the Gospel of Peter or the Gospel of Thomas. It's because these Gnostics were trying to claim that Peter wrote them or that Thomas wrote them. Right? <clears throat> it was all a ploy, right? And when modern scholars actually examine these texts, right, like the Gospel of Thomas, I believe, was actually uh, discovered in the 1800s, right? And they've basically proved through, you know, scholarship on handwriting and vocabulary and everything else that the Gospel of Thomas comes from over 600 years after, right, the birth of Jesus. So even though it claims to have been written by Thomas, the disciple, right, it actually was written 600 years later, right? So that's just an example. So those are some of the early heresies of the church, right? Jesus was just a good man. Right. Jesus was divinized at his baptism, right. and Jesus only appeared to be a man, or appeared to be a human. Right. So like the, the Docetists, they said that basically, you know, when they told the story about Jesus being crucified on the cross, they basically say that when Jesus was about to get on the cross, right, he basically disappeared, right? and that's what the, those texts describe. These are heresies. It was very clear early on the church condemned all these heresies without any like major disagreement or, or major councils uh, because the early apostles, right, they were still around when many of these heresies were arising. Right? So these people who had literally known Jesus and who had been there, right, they said that these were false. Right? They were heresies. Okay? So those are kind of the easy heresies to refute. Okay? Now, as time went on, some of these disputes actually became more complicated and caused a bigger stir right, and greater division in the church. And again, when you hear about these divisions, you might think, you know, like, well, maybe this is just, you know, people pulling hairs over things that don't really matter. Right? But they do matter. In the Protestant Reformation, for example, Right? A lot of people talk about the Protestant Reformation as like this great you know, heroic moment for Christianity 
and Martin Luther was this great hero. Right. What people don't realize is that in the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther actually had regrets on his deathbed about what he had caused. Because very early on, after he started the Protestant Reformation, there were people who were not agreeing with his doctrine. And by the time that he was dead, right, there were already multiple different strands of Protestant Christianity. The church was disintegrating. It was dividing itself. Usually people talk about like the three main reformers of Protestantism. They talk about Luther and Zwingli and John Calvin. Luther and Zwingli, they actually had a very famous debate. And they basically, at the end of the debate, they both agreed that they, that they would not be in agreement. Right? And that was, again, like the very beginning of the splintering of all the Protestant the different sects of Christianity. And to what we now have today of over 40,000 different Christian denominations and churches. Right? Even in our own town of Crawfordsville. Right? If you guys are familiar with some of the churches around town... Right? Like how there are multiple Baptist churches and multiple Methodist churches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Typically that happens because originally there was one, and then of course there became this divide. Right? And they couldn't agree on something. So then they had to go and have two Methodist churches, two Baptist churches. Right? That's why it's so important that we have a church to keep us united in these ways. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the major heresies that really began to um, call for universal church councils to try to figure out how to solve them. Right? The first one was Arianism. Arianism was started by, you guessed it, Arius. Arius. Okay. Arius was a priest living in North Africa. He was a apparently a very gifted preacher. And so many people are familiar with his teachings and his sermons. And Arius, over the course of his career as a priest, he started having some doubts about some of the church doctrine, right, that he had inherited and received. And his major doubt that he had about Jesus was that Arius thought it was basically, he thought it was impossible for God to be in heaven and also on earth. at the same time. That was the main doubt that he had. He thought about Jesus and he thought about how, you know, Jesus talked to his Father in heaven and yet Jesus was on earth. Jesus was claiming to be God and yet he was speaking to God who was in heaven. How is it possible that God can be in heaven and also on earth at the same time? That was the question he was asking. Now, some people might say that it's possible for, well, maybe there's just, maybe there's two gods. Some people might try to say that. But as we'll talk about more uh, next week, it's impossible for there to be two gods. Because the very definition of what God is, is that God is the creator of all things. If there were two gods, that would mean one of them had to have been created by the other. So you can't say that there are two gods. So Arius didn't know what to do. He thought it was impossible for God to be in two places at the same time. Next week, we'll talk more about the Trinity, right? Where we'll get more into this a little bit more. How can we say that God is one God but three persons? But this was the essential problem for Arius. So what Arius started doing 
as he started preaching to people about Christology and about Jesus, and he started saying that Jesus was not truly God, but rather the highest of all creatures. So some of the famous phrases from Arius is that he said, there was a time when the Son was not. The Son meaning Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity. There was a time when only God the Father existed, but not the Son. He said that Jesus is the first of all creatures and the greatest, but he's still a creature. Jesus is almost like a quasi-divine, quasi-human creature, according to Arius. He's not tr truly and fully God, but he's higher than human beings. Now again, you can understand why he would say things like this because he was wrestling with that question about how God could be in the same, how God could be in heaven and earth at the same time. But he was also thinking about some of the things that Jesus said in the Gospels. Jesus said in the Gospels, "The Father is greater than I am." There are times in the Gospels where it seems like Jesus is making himself lesser than God the Father in heaven. Right. And so Arius was pointing to all these different te in texts in the Gospels right, and saying clearly Jesus is trying to distinguish himself from the Father in that way. So he's not truly God. Right. Now as you might imagine... A very famous preacher in the heart of the Christian world, North Africa. And before the coming of Islam, North Africa was kind of like the... I mean, that was where a lot of the Christians were. That was where a lot of the major schools and uh, education places of the time were. So Arius became pretty well known. And this caused such a stir because pretty close by to Arius's diocese, there was a bishop who had a young deacon named Athanasius. <coughs> Saint Athanasius now, call him. And Saint Athanasius heard about Arius and started rebuking his teachings to his bishop. And eventually the dispute got so heated that eventually the Pope was brought in and so was the Emperor. Right, the Emperor Constantine. So, the Emperor Constantine decided to call the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This was kind of a significant time in the church because, can anybody think about something really important that happened in 313 AD? Twelve years before this, in terms of the church and Christianity. Does she know? In 313 AD, there was the Edict of Milan. Which allowed Christianity for the first time to be publicly recognized. So for literally the first 300 years of Christianity, Christians were always basically having to live in fear that there could be a persecution that would break out against them. It didn't happen all the time in the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire, as you know, when there was rebellions against the Roman Empire, 
It came down with a very swift hand. And oftentimes the Christians were seen as subversing the empire by subversing the public religions of the empire. And so oftentimes they were, they were persecuted. So the Edict of Milan, under the Emperor Constantine, for the very first time the Roman Emperor declared Christianity to be a publicly recognized religion that could not be persecuted. Why this is significant is because that means that before this time, even if there were a very large heresy in the church, you couldn't hold a major council like what happened in 325 AD. Because Christians couldn't have a public debate with all the bishops from the world sponsored by the Roman emperor. So this is the first time in church history that you had a really major universal worldwide council. Right? And it was held at Nicaea in 325 AD. And basically what happened at that council is they discussed the Arian heresy. Um, this is also where famously, according to church legend, St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas from where we get you know, St. Nicholas, St. Claus, right? St. Nicholas apparently when the council was convened and all the bishops entered, when the priest Arius was walking in, apparently St. Nicholas assaulted him right? and punched him in the face right? out of zeal for the Lord. Right? So goes the stories. Right? Where, where is Nicaea? Nicaea, uh, I'm not exactly sure. It's somewhere in the Roman Empire. Uh, I wish we had a map, but we don't. I thought you were going to be like, it's in that corner of the room. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't remember, I don't recall exactly where Nicaea is. Okay. It was in the, I mean, it was considered to be a somewhat neutral location, given the parties that were involved. That's all I remember, specifically. Okay. So when, was the, when did we have the first pope? The first pope is St. Peter himself. Yeah, but we have. Uh, so in around 30 AD, right, Jesus changed his name to Peter. And his name was Simon. Yeah. And his name was changed to Peter. Pope literally just means the father. Right? Pope is comes from the Italian word for father, right? Or the Latin word for father. So when did they start calling Peter the Pope? Is that what you're asking? No, my question is, is okay, so in I see at the Council of Night in three hundred twenty five AD mm -hmm. they made Christianity you know open thing, I guess, public. Mm -hmm. public. Mm -hmm. So, but we had a pope way before that, and it was, it was still... The pope, was, yes, so the pope has always existed from the days of St. Peter onward. It's just that, um, you know, like the, the way we think of the pope today with the white cassock and the pope mobile and the yeah. Swiss guard, right? Like, obviously all that stuff developed as time went on, and even in the early days of the church, I mean, it just kind of depended on what was happening in, in the empire. Right? Sometimes the Pope could be more public about his authority. Sometimes he had to be a little more, you know, undercover about how he went about okay. things. Okay. Is that, that's kind of what yeah, you're asking? Yeah, yeah, that's my question. Was the Pope, you know, was he out there? Was he, you know, preaching Christianity? Was he, 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 was... he was, but you also have to put yourself in the mindset of this time. <clears throat> All right, this is before internet. This is before TVs. This is before the printing press, right? So the Pope was living in Rome, right? And most of the places of the Roman Empire, right? it would not have been very easy for him to communicate right, throughout the empire. Right? Again, I mean, this is before automobiles, before the internet, before telephones, I mean, all that stuff. So even at the Council of Nicaea, for example, the Pope actually did not even go to the Council. He sent his, his representatives, his legates, to the council. Because just the travel to get to Nicaea was a pretty long and arduous journey. Right? So the Pope wasn't even there. It was only his representatives. Yeah. Nicaea is in Turkey. Nicaea is in Turkey. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yes, Janet? When was the Great Schism again? Great Schism was in 10... 54. Yeah. Turkey. 
Chandler's talking about the, the Great Schism where the Catholic Church, right, when basically it split into the East and the West where you had the Orthodox and then the Roman Catholics. It happened in 1054. Okay. All right, so at the Council of Nicaea in 325, everybody hammered this stuff out, right? Is Arius right? Or is Athanasius right? And if Athanasius is right, how exactly do we explain this? And so basically what they did was they examined the text of the New Testament where Jesus, you know, sometimes he seems to say that he's not equal with God the Father. Other times he claims, he seems to say that he is. Like when St. Philip, he asked Jesus, right, just before he was arrested, he said, Jesus, show us the Father. Right? And Jesus responded by saying, the Father and I are one. So that obviously seems to indicate that, you know, they're on the same level. <coughs> So what St. Athanasius did is he basically, you know, argued with all these different passages and he tried to find a way to make all of them fit together. Right? And what the church ultimately decided is that Jesus truly is God. He's not the highest of all creatures. He's not the first of all creation. Jesus is truly God. He is God from God, light from light. He is begotten, not made. So even though he's always been the Son of God, he was not made or created. Right at a moment in time. He has always existed as the Son of God. Just as God the Father has always existed as the Father. Right. And ultimately the reason why they said this is they said, if Jesus is not truly God and truly man, then we can't really be saved. That's the ultimate problem. Right. In order to be redeemed... In a just universe, with a just God, human beings had committed an offense against an infinite being, and therefore we needed an infinitely perfect redeem, redemption. And that's why Jesus had to be infinite. He had to be God. But he also had to truly be a man. Otherwise, he's not actually redeeming us. So the creed, as we say every Sunday, right? is basically a product of this Council of Nicaea. And as you could tell when I was saying God from God, light from light, true God from true God, right? All of those statements that we recite every Sunday, they come from all the way back to this Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. The last thing I'll say about uh, Arius before we take a break is that Arianism, even though it was condemned by the church, it still lived on in many parts of the empire. So remember how Mark was asking about the Pope, right? And was he at this council? The Pope was not at the Council of Nicaea. <coughs> he just sent his representatives. And because Christianity was now a publicly recognized religion, and the emperor himself claimed to be a Christian, although he actually wasn't baptized until he was dying, he waited to be baptized just in case. <laughs> he didn't want to get baptized and then, you know, commit sins again and, you know, lose his salvation. Right. So he thought. Right. <clears throat> so what ended up happening is that because the emperor was a Christian, Christianity went from being this small persecuted sect of the empire to all of a sudden having a huge amount of clout right, in the empire. And within about a hundred years... Christianity was the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. Which meant that sometimes priests and bishops, they didn't exactly have the right motivations. And they became corrupt. And it almost became more about politics than about devotion to God. And so this Arian heresy 
actually continued to live on in many ways. And some Roman emperors actually were professed Arians themselves. Many bishops in the church were Arians. According to most estimates, about two-thirds of bishops in the church were Arians. And it became a very politically charged uh, debate. St. Athanasius himself, basically after the Council of Nicaea, he spent the most of the rest of his life actually living in exile. So Arianism continued to live on in the church, even though the church never officially taught it, there were still many people in the church holding it. And that's actually probably one of the reasons why Islam, in uh, the year 622, right, or in the 630s, when Muhammad really started to take off, that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of people embraced Islam very quickly. Is because Islam teaches something very similar to Arianism. Jesus is special, but he's not truly God. So that's another thing, you know, if we, we talk more about church history, right, as we go on through these classes, is that sometimes heresies don't just go away because the church condemns them. Sometimes those heresies continue to live on very much, especially in different parts of the church. And what we will learn by going through these different heresies and everything is that time and time again, typically the heresies came from the eastern part of the empire, and it was constantly the popes living in the west right, that kept condemning these heresies. That's one of the many reasons why eventually in 1054 AD, many of the eastern bishops actually separated themselves from Rome. All right, that's the Arian heresy. Uh, any questions about the Arian heresy? You guys want to take a break? All right, let's take, let's take a five minute break. Remember if you have questions, if you want to ask them anonymously, write them down and put them in the basket. Is everybody okay? You guys seem really quiet. It's cold, Father. Too cold winter. We're all depressed. <laughs> 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 I said Arianism still loved on. Still lived on. <laughs> Maybe it is still loved on.
Okay, guys, we have some good questions that were submitted. It's good, so we're going to go through these questions before we move on. Okay. All right, first question is, why can only Catholics receive the body of Christ? Why can only Catholics receive the body of Christ? Uh, there's essentially two answers. First is because it's the way that it's always been. Um, one of the earliest uh, church documents that we have is something called the Didache. Right, the Didache. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Didache Bible, which is named after the Didache, even though it's really not related to it. The Didache, basically what scholars think is the Didache was written sometime around the end of the first century A.D. So like literally like during the time of the Apostles. And what scholars think is that it was basically a collective document written by some of the apostles and early bishops of the church with guidelines for worship and other moral teachings of the church. And already right there in the Didache, it talks about the Eucharist and about how only people who believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus should be receiving it. Same way with many of the other church fathers, like St. Ignatius, St. Justin Martyr, right? many of the early church fathers, right, writing within 100 or 200 years of Jesus, they're already talking about people needing to share the belief in the Eucharist in order to receive it. Not only that, but also confessing their sins before they receive the Eucharist too. So that's the basic answer, is it's just the way that it's always been. It's not like this is just a rule that we made up 50 years ago, right? It's always been this way, and the earliest documents we have talking about the Eucharist describe this. But then more fundamentally, why can only Catholics receive the body of Christ? It's because most Christians don't believe in the Eucharist. And so when people come forward to receive communion at Mass, they literally say amen, which means I believe. As in, I believe what the Catholic Church teaches about this. So if somebody were to receive the Eucharist not having that belief... It's almost like, you know, what, what do they call that when you tell a lie, like in a courtroom, like libeling yourself? Perjury. Perjury, right? That's kind of what it's like, right? It's, <coughs> it's like acting out a lie. You don't really believe this, and yet you're pretending like you do. Right? Also, St. Paul, I uh, can't remember which letter of the New Testament. I think it's in Corinthians. Uh, but he says that he who eats or drinks the cup of the Lord... Right, in an unworthy manner, eats or drinks judgment upon himself. So even St. Paul talked about it. Right? That we have to receive the body of Christ in a worthy manner. Right? Which means we have to enter the church, which means we have to confess our sins, we have to really believe what it is. Right? So that's why only practicing Catholics can receive the body of Christ. Anybody who wants to receive the Eucharist who is not a Catholic, they surely can, they just have to become Catholic. I had, a, I had a priest in seminary, he said that sometimes when he would 
when people would ask him that question, they would say, you know, like, well, I, I believe in Jesus, why can't I receive the Eucharist? And he would say, why aren't you Catholic? And they would say, and he'd say, well, that's why you can't receive the Eucharist. <laughs> What's the best way to grow in the spiritual life? Uh, there's a number of great things you can do to grow in the spiritual life. Um, many people are familiar with the rosary. It's a great spiritual practice. Uh, another thing I always recommend is Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina just means you know, holy reading. And all that means is it just means that you reflect on the Bible. Like, instead of picking up your Bible and just reading a bunch of chapters straight through, it means that you would just open up to a passage, read a few verses, and just read through it slowly and see if anything sticks out to you, or if God is speaking to you in some way. Right? You focus on the words or phrases that um, you feel like God is trying to say something to you. Fyodor Dostoevsky, the famous Russian author, when he was dying, he used to have his wife always randomly open up to a passage of the Gospels. And he would basically try to listen for signs from God. He felt like God was speaking to him through the passage. So that's a great thing you can do. Especially if you have a, you know, something that's causing you anxiety or worry. Right? Opening up to a random passage of the Bible and just asking for a word that God might speak to you. I also definitely recommend the examine prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers. I'm not going into a ton of depth on, on all these things because you can always, you know, you can look these things up on the internet and you can, or you can buy like little devotional books, right, that kind of walk you through some of this stuff. But the examine prayer is basically, it's just an extended reflection on your day. So basically, the examined prayer is, you know, you just find a, you find a time to pray, you set aside 10 minutes, you spend the first couple minutes just trying to kind of get rid of the distractions, right, like what's going on in your job and your family or whatever else it is, right, you just try to focus, right? and then you just uh, ask God for guidance and you basically reflect on your day, right, and what you're doing is you're trying to ask God to basically show you how he was trying to form you throughout the day, right? Or what were the times that you uh, you screwed up, right? Mm -hmm. That God was, you know, inviting you to something and you ignored it. Right? It's a way of trying to reflect on your day and try to think, you know, what were the opportunities that I had to glorify God throughout the day? And again, you can, you can look this stuff up on the internet, and some people will tell you different ways to do it, but that's essentially what it is. Socrates once said, the unexamined life is a life not worth living. Right? And that's basically what the examined prayer is. It's a way of learning how to examine your life, but particularly through the eyes of God. Right? How is God with you? Right? Is there a correct way to pray? There's lots of correct ways to pray. There's not, there's not really any wrong ways to pray other than idolatry, right? Like uh, praying to a foreign god or many exorcists will say that certain spiritual practices are not recommended because oftentimes spiritual practices that are not explicitly Christian, they involve some sort of idolatry. Like a lot of times most exorcists will say things like people shouldn't be doing yoga and things like that. It's not something uh, that I'm aware of that the church has officially said. That's just what most exorcists say. They say you should really avoid the kind of new age spiritual practices. Okay. All right, next question. This is a great question. Why can't I just go to confession right before I die and be saved? <laughs> well, the answer is that you actually could. Right. Um, if you, if you wanted to wait till the very end of your life right, to confess your sins right, and be absolved on your deathbed, I mean, you would be saved. 
The problem is, is that most of us, we don't know when our end is coming, right? So we should always be prepared. <laughs> it's always important when we're thinking about salvation, and I do actually think we're going to talk about this in another class, about salvation. The church doesn't really talk so much about people for sure being condemned. The church likes to say that, you know, there are many ways, there are many paths to salvation, but they all go through Jesus. Right? So whether that's the person who is faithful all their lives, whether it's the person who, you know, had a, had a conversion at the end of their life, <coughs> whether it's somebody like Constantine who waited to be baptized on his deathbed, you know, the church just says that the only way to be saved is through Jesus, but there's a lot of different ways, right, that people come to that. Right? The Catechism of the Catholic Church actually even says that even atheists, that we can hope that they may be saved if through no fault of their own, they cannot come to belief in God. Like maybe somebody who has suffered so much in their life or been betrayed by people in the church so much, right? That perhaps God would have mercy and compassion on them in that way and would not hold it against them. So sometimes like really conservative Christians, they'll want to say things like, you know, unless somebody explicitly confesses Jesus with their lips, they, it's impossible for them to be saved. Those are not the kind of statements that the Catholic Church makes. The Catholic Church says things like, we could hope for all people. We know that there are certain requirements and that God is just. But we're not here to you know, say specifically any one person is condemned. We're, we're trying to hope for everyone. All right, so those are some good questions. Okay, um, You guys ready to move on? All right, awesome. So now we're going to get into the really interesting ones. Okay. Craig was asking about the two intellects earlier. That's the stuff we're going to get into now. Okay. So after the Council of Nicaea, the heresies became a little bit more complicated, right? And the questions kept getting asked. Right? The next heresy that arose was something called Apollinarianism. Named after Apollinarius. Essentially, he believed that Christ was not fully human. He was not fully human. Apollinarius thought that God in Jesus, he assumed a body but not a human soul. That's a pretty fair, you know, thought, right? Like, Jesus, he had a human body, right? He appeared to just be human, but really, he was completely divine on the inside. His body was just like a costume that he put on, right? But he wasn't fully human. He, he, only, he only had a human body. And what St. Gregory of Nazianzus became kind of the champion against this teaching. He said that if Jesus truly did redeem us, if he has to be truly human, that means that he has to have everything that comes with being fully human. And human beings are not just bodies. Human beings are bodies and soul. So Jesus couldn't just have a human body, he also had to have a human soul. Follow me so far? Okay. What are the parts of a soul? We all know the different parts of the body. Right? Our arms, our fingers, our legs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also parts of the soul. You have the intellect. You have the will. You have emotions. All of these things are a part of a human soul. 
And so if Jesus really is our Redeemer, if he really has to be fully human, that means that he has to have a human soul as well as a human body. Which means that not only does he have a human body, he has a human intellect, a human will, he has human emotions. But God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit does not have a body. but does have a soul. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they all have intellect, will, and God doesn't have emotions because emotions are really based on you know, our physical experience. So technically speaking, God doesn't have emotions. But he does have an intellect and a will. It's divine nature. So, as Gregory of Nazianza said, he has to be fully human, which means he has to have a human intellect and a human will. Gregory of Nazianza was famous for saying, what has not been assumed has not been redeemed. Okay. Gregory of Nazianzus. What has not been assumed has not been redeemed. Has not been redeemed. Which means that when Jesus became incarnate, he assumed not only a human body, but a human intellect, human will, and human emotions. So if Jesus already had his divine intellect, and then he assumed a human intellect as well, that means that he had two intellects. Two intellects. Does that make sense? It's really hard to fathom, again, the incomprehensibleness of all this, right? What that would have been like for Jesus, right? What's it like to have two intellects and two wills? One of the great analogies for this is something from Archbishop Fulton Sheen that I've always thought was really helpful for understanding this. It's how you understand what a nature is in a person. Nature versus person. Nature is what someone is. Person is who someone is. Everybody in this room is a human. We have a human nature. But Evelyn is not Caroline. Craig is not Kathy. We all have the same nature, but we're not the same person. And what Fulton Sheen said about this is that when you think about the two natures of Jesus under one person... He gave the analogy of somebody writing with a marker. And he said, think about it this way. Think of your hand as one nature, the marker as another nature. But you are the person writing. The person writing utilizes their hand and the marker, but it's not the hand that writes or the marker that writes. It's the person that writes. Right. So Jesus, and he always remained one person, 
And he had the ability to use his intellect and will, the divine intellect and divine will. And then when he assumed a human nature, he also received the human capacities. But he was still the same person. In other words, remember the quiz question, in the incarnation, it wasn't that the divine nature became the human nature. It's that Jesus had his divine nature already, and then he also assumed a human nature to himself. So then he had two natures, but was still one person. Now when I use a marker to write on the board, right, I may receive a new tool, but I don't actually change as a person. Right? The way that I think, the way that I see, the way that I understand, it remains the same. Because I'm still the same person. That's why the church has always taught that Jesus, when he assumed a human nature, even when he was just an infant, he was still the same person. So he knew who he was. He knew that he was God. He knew that he was the Savior. Right? Because just by assuming another nature doesn't mean that you stop being who you are as a person. What do you guys think? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty deep stuff, right? <laughs> yes, Evelyn? I have some questions. <laughs> yes. Um, first off, I'm pretty sure you've talked about this before, or maybe Chandler joked about it when we were planning RE classes. I don't know. Does, did God have a human nature before, like since the beginning of time? No. No. He did not. So like there was an exact point <coughs> in time. Like the so that's what Evelyn is asking, did Jesus always have a human nature from the beginning of time? And the answer is no. Okay. When he was conceived in Mary's womb, it was in that moment that the incarnation took place. Okay. It was in that moment where he assumed a human nature to himself. Up until that point, he did not. But he still has a human nature, even though... Yes. Okay. He still has a human nature. And then, does God, since, since a soul is made up of an intellect and a will, does that then mean that God has two souls? If Jesus uh, is God, or or that Jesus has two souls, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know. That that gets more into like the Trinitarian stuff of like how you wanna. Um, as far as I'm aware, the church has never explicitly said that Jesus has two souls. Okay. You could. I mean, depending on what you mean by that, mm -hmm. right, I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But the terminology that has been specifically defined by the church is the intellect and the will. Okay. That Jesus has two intellects and two wills. Gotcha. That's a good question. And again, as you can see from all this conversation, right, this is what I meant earlier when the church, it figures out things via heresy. Right? It's hard to just tell somebody that Jesus has two natures and two intellects and two wills. People are like, what, what the heck are you talking about? But when you think through it step by step, you realize that if he really is the Redeemer, then all of these things follow from that. Right? And it takes time to figure this out. Yeah. yeah. So is the will just like the mode of the intellect? Like, can you just go into more detail about those two? So the intellect... The intellect is our ability to understand. Whereas the will is what we choose. And obviously the two affect each other. The more that we understand, the more powerful our will is. Because the more we know, the easier it is to choose the good or choose the right things. Likewise, if we choose a bunch of bad stuff, that's likely going to cloud our understanding. 
if you choose to become an alcoholic, right, over time, you're going to have less and less wisdom and understanding, right? The, the two go hand in hand, right? So Jesus, having a human intellect and a human will, right, but he also had a divine intellect and a divine will. So what does it mean to say that Jesus had a divine intellect and also a human intellect? It means God is omniscient and right? he knows everything. Right? So Jesus really did know everything. Right? And yet, in his human intellect, his human intellect actually acquired knowledge throughout his life. He learned things in a human way. For example, he learned what it means to suffer. Because God, in the divine nature, cannot suffer. God is all-powerful. So Jesus literally experienced something after the Incarnation that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit will never experience. Because they don't have human intellects. They only have the divine intellect. So Jesus did, he knew all things that God knows, but by means of human experience, he learned things that you could only learn as a human. Suffering, temptation, those kinds of things. All right, this was defined at the Council of Constantinople, In 381 A.D. 381 A.D. And I think that's about the end of our time. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? So her question a second ago about two souls was because he was the father and the son. And is that? It's because, um, well, maybe, Father, you want to give a definition for a soul. Earlier it was discussed that a soul is made up of an intellect and a will. Yeah. So if Jesus has a divine intellect and a divine will, that's one soul. If he has a human intellect and a human will, okay. then that's another soul. Okay. So that was kind of where that came from. So, and the reason why it would not apply to the Trinity is because, remember, person is who someone is. Nature is what someone is. Right? Soul is part of nature. Right? Humans have bodies and souls. Right? The person is not the same as the body. The person is not the same as the soul. Right? A person is somebody who has the human nature right? and is individuated. So what, what Evelyn was asking about Jesus having two souls, what I said is that you know you might be able to use that terminology, but as far as I understand, the church has never used that terminology before. Okay. It's stuck with the intellect and will. And I personally, I don't think it would be correct. I'd have to look that up a little bit more, but I don't think that we would want to say that Jesus has two souls. Just that he has two intellects and two wills. Yep. All right? Okay. Do you guys think this is fun? This is interesting? I mean, this is like, this is a, uh, this will be the most, you know, this class and the next class when we talk about the Trinity, these will be the two most, you know, complicated uh, of the classes that we'll go through. <laughs> Um, but I do think it's good for us to think about this stuff because, again, it teaches us why we need a church. Right? Jesus left us a church for a reason because he knew there were going to be divisions that would arise and we needed to have a way of staying united right, to the infallible uh, authority of the church. But I also think it's important for us because, you know, many of us, we think about God and, you know, we kind of just want to 
reduce Christianity sometimes to just a bunch of moral teachings. But it's important for us to really reflect, the more we know a person and understand a person, the more that we're able to love them. And so if we really want to love Jesus, it's important for us to grow in our understanding of who he actually is and what he actually did for us in the incarnation and salvation. All right. I think, uh, do we have any announcements, Hillary? Are you trying to get yeah, them? Yeah, I'm going to talk to the confirmation group. Okay, so we'll meet again next week at 7 p.m. Same time, same place. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.